Talk about just the the 12th man and 106,000 second largest crowd in the history. Let me of tell the you stadium. something. That atmosphere and environment tonight. You don't want to play in that. Something wrong with you. That that right there. That that recruits and the people and the love. I mean that that that's as good environment and atmosphere as there is in college football, bar none. I don't care where it's at. Those people are behind you, and I'm thankful we won the game for them, and I mean that for our players, for everybody who believes in us, and our, especially our fans, though, because, listen, this, this place deserves a great football team. We're doing everything in our power to make it that way, and we're going to try to get it there. We've got a lot of work to do, and we're growing. But this, this fan base is tremendous, and the atmosphere and environment is the best in college football. Talk about what you could improve on from the time that you all met up last year at all. You know, this wasn't about <clears throat> this week getting ready to play this defense. You know, this was 12 months. So, you know, when you get embarrassed like we did a year ago, um, at least me, you know, offensively, we're going to try everything we can to figure out how to how to beat you. I'm not allowed to say the word sucks, is it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it's, this weather sucks. <laughs> oh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter, and I'm joined as always by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Balls on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, man, what's it like <laughs> to be world famous, Shane? We've, we've never had a video podcast done as well mm. as the one starring cousin Shane. They're here for you, brother. They ain't here for me. <sighs> I know, want, 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 back to audio, you know? <laughs> hey, I, I thought, I, I, just to, just, I don't know, it, it was it was awesome doing it. it. It's something we were talking about before we started recording here. It was just, it was it, it was easier. It's easier talking to you face-to-face and just know that we, we are trying. We're trying to figure out, if uh, you know, our next step. What, what are we going to do? We're kind of in limbo, uh, but I will tell you, brother, that the fan support, coming out and, and, you know, just giving us the support that we needed. I, I That's what I want to say. I just want to – I was like, man, it could come out. We could fall on our face and never do it again, you know. <laughs> but then I tell you, it just the fans have been so supportive and uh, it really, really meant a lot to, to me. I know it meant a lot to you, Mike. And, uh, yeah, man, these guys, these girls, the guys and girls, all of them, they're ready to see this 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 thing go to the next step. And uh, I'm ready, man. I tell you, that that – that's what I needed. I just needed to rip the band aid, and that's what we did. I was I drank a little more than I was supposed to, but uh, <laughs> that's part of live shows, man. <laughs> exactly, like you said, Shane. It's nice to know when you put in the effort. I mean, it, it ain't easy. You should see the setup uh, that you know yeah. that it takes to to go down there and do it. But it was totally worth it to hang out with you and get the feedback from the audience. So we're gonna have more shows like that this off season, mm-hmm. and who we're working behind the scenes. Hopefully. We may be coming to you in that version all season long. So, <laughs> hey, we're just throwing that out there. That's a possibility. Let us know yep. if that's something you'd be interested in. But, Shane, we got a great show lined up here. We got Mike Morgan. He's an ESPN SEC Network announcer. He called mm-hmm. the Kentucky Spring, the Blue and White Spring game. So we're going to go on a little deep dive on the Kentucky Spring game. And he's a Heisman Trophy voter. So a lot of different topics to discuss with Mike Morgan. But before we get to that, Shay, we got some news and notes around the SEC. And I got to start with this little viral clip. If you haven't seen it, it's perfect for the YouTube if you're not already. Nick Saban taking cake away from one of the losers from (laughs) A-Day. So if you're just listening in, you may have not got a full picture there, but uh, if you don't know, the winners of an A-Day Alabama game, they got a steak, they get cake, Mm -hmm. the losers got fried beans to eat, Shane. Mm -hmm. And some of the losers came over here, tried to steal some cake, Nick Saban shut that down, and hey, let it be known, Coach Saban runs a tight ship. Not having it, man, not having it. It's so fun because... Coach was just so – you saw him a little bit in the off season, kind of cutting up, you know, really really enjoying this. But then you can see it, man, the, the competitive edge. There, there's no – there's no such thing as, as, a, as, a, as a 
there's no consolation prize. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, even if it's his own boys, he, he, he ain't got time for that. He's only going to, uh, he's only going to give you a cake if you're a winner. So that's what we love about Nick Saban. Cause when it comes, I mean, it's all fun and games until we hit the field and, and you can see it doesn't matter. Even if it's a spring game, you're saying, Hey, it doesn't mean anything. It means something to him. And it means, and that's, what the kind of culture he's going to create in that locker room. So it was fun seeing them cut up a little bit, but you could still see saving what go let that happen. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, Shade, one reason I really wanted to reach out to you and have you on the show, Lane Kiffin doing Lane Kiffin things mm-hmm. this off season was recently a guest on the Rich Eisen show. Mm-hmm. And somehow the conversation turned to NIL and, all this money Tennessee's paying for all these players. It's just not fair. <laughs> Last year it was Texas A&M he's bad at. Now he shifted it to Tennessee. Let's kick it over to Lane Kiffin to uh, bitch and moan a little bit more. I, I had uh, Coach Saban on, uh, and I'll ask you the same thing I, I asked him uh, about the comments from your colleague in Clemson, from Dib- Dabo Swinney, that – he believes that what's going on with NIL, that college football is headed for uh, a reckoning. To get blown up is the word that he used. Would you agree with that assessment, Lane Kiffin? I read that. I actually texted him good job um, on it because it is. I, I'm for that the kids make money. It's just there's no, I said it from day one, you know, put a, no salary cap in the NFL. How does that work? You know, and different teams have different money, and then there's no there's no real contracts on a lot of it. You know, it's, they're not necessarily locked in. You know, so technically everybody could be a free agent every year. And really, if you're a great, I mean, think how messed up the system is. If you're a great player, you know, you're Bryce showing after the national championship last year. You should go in the portal even if you want to stay at Alabama, because all you'll do is drive up your price there because then the collectives there will suddenly come up with a lot of money from Alabama people to keep you. So what would any player do that could opt into a free agent, free agency every year? They would do it, test the market, you know, and get the most they could. We have started to see a few at places. I think, you know, it's not, they weren't unhappy. They just figured this out. Like, Hey, I, you know, can maybe come back where I'm at, but let me see what I can get paid. So, and you're going to have all these locker room dynamics where now you're reading, you know, you got a player coming into school over there in East Tennessee, that, you know, for $8 million, it hasn't played it down, and you got a locker room saying, wait, now what if the guy doesn't play? How's that going to work? And then how is the donor going to feel that paid all that money when the guy's not playing? And so you got a lot of things that haven't been figured out at all. All right, Shane. So because he's <laughs> calling you out, basically he's calling yeah. you out personally, cousin Shane. Yeah, for, that's what it felt like. For Tennessee put in all this money to get players, which is completely legal now. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But let me ask you seriously about uh, one thing he did kind of hit on here, which is an unknown for all of us. What do you think that locker room dynamic is going to be when you've got a potentially multimillionaire in that locker room? Uh, do you think that changes anything uh, in the Tennessee, and not just Tennessee, but but across the SEC? No, because because mon- this isn't. We're not just now giving money out, Mike. You know, we're not right. just now giving clout out. These, when you you think Tua rolled up into Tuscaloosa <laughs> and, and people treated him just like another player? You know what I'm saying? He was a superstar before he arrived to campus. So mm-hmm. to say that it's going to be different now that they have money is the dumbest thing I ever heard of. In fact, I, I, I like when I hear Lane come out with these these weeping comments, and he's not alone. There's other coaches. I put myself in Lane's shoes. If I had boosters reaching out and getting a quarterback that I wanted paying $8 million, I would not be saying a damn thing. It's just like the whole uh, faint and goat thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> yeah, he just – it, they they didn't get that taken away from them, so you didn't hear them out here saying, "Well, you know, they should relook at this because it just isn't fair." No, it, it's Lane's. That's just who he is, and it's not happening at his university. Uh, maybe it is just at a smaller scale, but you know, this is the SEC, brother. You're gonna have to buy in because this is the next chapter of college football. Until they put some some bumpers on this thing and slow it down, it, it is it is ever is the wild wild west out there. Yeah, and. You know, I, I think I discussed this with you at the time, Shane, but uh, you may have forgotten it. 
when it was last July when NAL, you know, officially became legal and mm -hmm. there was websites set up where you could register, you could kind of pick the, the athlete you want. And there's, there's a yep. price tag for, you know, how much their time costs. And mm -hmm. I believe Matt Corral, it was either 10 or $20,000 an hour. And I said, Matt Corral's never going to be on this show. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, hey, it wasn't an issue for Matt Corral, yet it's an issue for Tennessee's right. quarterback. It just doesn't make much sense. And and I get, you know, Lane Kiffin's not the only one. He just seems to be the most vocal when it comes to yeah. it. And I guarantee you, Shane, if Ole Miss and their boosters were leading the way on NAL, this would not be an issue for old Lane Kiffin. You know what? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. These guys are watching it slip away. I'll never forget, you know, growing up in the 90s, um, there, there was programs that that had no trouble getting players to come to – I mean, there was, Knoxville's a great place to play, but they, a lot of these kids coming to Knoxville weren't coming because Knoxville's pretty. You know, they were coming because the facilities were legit. Mm -hmm. We were always top-notch. We had high boosters. These guys were getting paid. Athens, same thing. You know, I, it's – it, it, you see these big these teams that have always been competitive when it comes to recruiting, and then the SEC channel comes on, and then all of a sudden we're not we don't have the prettiest campus anymore. We're competing with all fourteen teams, you know. So that's that's just the the evolution of college football, and then so it made it even playing field. Well, now the NIL's coming out, and you're seeing some of these guys take advantage of it. I, I fully expect either a they do some sort of governing on it, or B, these other other universities start playing their paying their players. So uh, it's either buy in or get out. So yeah. I think that's what's going to happen here, man. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that. We got one more clip, Shane. When it comes to NIL, these were from a couple of days ago, but uh, sticking on that theme and and carrying over to our conversation in a moment here with Mike Morgan. Mark Stoops was asked about NIL, and he kind of went a step further. He went a little heated here. <laughs> He's right there with you. Maybe some regulation or maybe, uh, you know, those Kentucky boosters, maybe they need to sell a little bit more bourbon this year. <laughs> what are you in position to do in terms of just encouraging that? That's a great question because I was about to answer you. What am I, you know, allowed to do is not much. You know what I mean? So – Except encourage, like you said, because I think, um, you know, early on there was a lot of questions. Heck, I had questions. I still do. I've asked to meet with Compliance and Mitch and, and let's get on the same page and let's do what we can. Because what you're seeing is some doing more than others. I mean, that, that's obvious. And... Um, I think if you ask most coaches, and I, I've started to see some some SEC coaches and others, you know, discussing all of our concerns on our players, guys that are here, we all are happy that they're able to profit from their name, image, and likeness. They do a lot for us. And with that, they should be able to, to earn some money. I think we all are a bit concerned about the – Let's just put a collective together with $10 million and buy recruits. I mean, let's buy 25 free agents a year. You know, and that, again, is that really what we got into this for? Or did we get into it to support the Chris Rodriguez's and others and guys that have done so much for us and work really hard, you know what I mean? Or is it let's just get a collective, let's get 15 wealthy boosters together, put it in a collective, which is legal. I want to make that clear to everybody that wants to put it in a collective. <laughs> that is totally legal. You're just essentially putting that money in for futures. You know, much different than people say, hey, I'm going to advertise for the Masters next year or the Super Bowl next year. You don't know who's going to be in it, but you're allowed to put that in there. So that is totally legal. And whether I want that or not, or whether I want our administration wants it. That's not our choice. It's legal. And and I think you see some universities and some SEC schools taking full advantage of that. And uh, then you see others that are not because there's only so much money to go around and where are you going to put that money and all those things. So um, it's changing the landscape. And uh, anytime you make drastic changes like that, 
there are certainly some unintended consequences that come with these decisions. Again, I think it's a positive, but the I'd like to see some federal help or some federal legislation on the total pay for play that's going on right now. That that was supposed to be illegal, uh, but it's certainly not. You know, being enforced and you know it's it's a hundred percent happening out there. So, what are we going to do about it? You you know, another thing is is I'm always going to fight the fight. Whatever it is, we're going to overcome it. We're going to adapt, and we're going to be successful at it. This piece, uh, uh, we need to we need a lot of people to get on the same page with this. So I just thought that was great shade, and uh, you know, it's not like we're just sitting here picking on Lane Kiffin. He's just the one that's no. that's most vocal. All these coaches are dealing with this, but right. it's all about you're going to adapt to the, the current rules, or you're going to fall by the wayside. And mm -hmm. in the SEC, it's just so damn competitive. Anything you can use to help your program, you just basically got to go all in on it. You know what? Yeah, it is, man, and it's and it is uncharted territory, and we don't. We don't know how this thing's going to play out. I mean, to sit here and, and act like we, we know what five years from now exactly how this NIL is going to work is crazy. This is just is getting rolled out, and a lot of people said, well, you know, it's not going to affect recruiting. Well, if you really thought the NIL was not going to affect recruiting, you have another damn thing coming. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, you – what they say, I, I they, I'll sell you beachfront property in Arizona or something like that. I don't know. I think there's a song like that, but oceanfront property. That's it. You know what I'm saying? It's just we knew that this was going to be part of the NIL, and and the and the programs that grasp that early were going to be the ones that succeed, and that's the ones that you're not hearing complain. Do you hear Nick Saban out here complaining about the NIL? Kirby Smart getting on a loudspeaker and, and, and preaching about the NIL. Do you hear Chip Kelly getting – I mean, there's all kinds of programs, even up north. They're, they're not bitching about the NIL because their boosters are paying these players to come to their campus. Yeah, no doubt. And speaking of that, Shane, I'm not saying this guy is getting paid or anything, but I do have a funny comment here because if you missed it, Tennessee just landed a commitment from the state's top prospect – four-star pass rusher Caleb Herring. Mm -hmm. The Vols currently have a top 10 recruiting class. Come on. And, you know, that's important for many reasons. Josh Heupel and company, they need to lock down the state after, you know, having a rough go of it last recruiting cycle. But mm -hmm. I only wanted to bring that up, Shane, because I saw the funniest comment right under his commitment. Did you get $8 million too? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that is one thing that I am curious that I'm, – I'm not worried about the front end uh, of the recruiting thing. You know, I know it's been a little bit messy, but I'm worried about the back end when you've got some seasoned players. What happens when you got a player that, I don't know, maybe he wasn't paid much. Maybe he was paid 50000 in NIL and he was able to do a few things with it. But, you know, he has a, a sophomore breakout season and – and then here comes another quarterback that's not taking a stat when he gets $8 million. You know, I, I am a little curious how that plays out just because you want to get paid what you're worth. Mm -hmm. And and it would be tough, you know, to be a uh, – I don't know, just think of any of these guys that just – like uh, like Tillman or something, you know. He here he is. He he had a breakout season, and then we go out and we pay a receiver x amount of dollars, and it's more than Tillman's getting right now with NIL. Does that does that create a little controversy? Does that create a transfer portal situation? That's that's the only part I'm worried about is the fallout because you know if you could go out and you. Like these 24 sevens, they're getting so much better at, at, at doing these composite rankings and stuff, but we never always get it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you go in, there's always bust, and there's these kids, we're not going to give them an opportunity to bust before we pay them. And if they come to the campus and it doesn't work out, it's like, yeah, that was a bad bet, but do you take the money that you gave that kid and give it to someone else that's popping on your program? I, I don't know. I'm just kind of. That's the part I'm I'm curious how it plays out. Yeah, no doubt. And, and one other thing, Shane, speaking of recruiting, I just wanted to make note of this because this is 
I know it's early. You know, we're not. I'm, I'm yeah. not going overboard here, but this is just remarkable because Arkansas, right before we hopped on the line, they landed them a commitment from a four-star offensive lineman out of the state of Tennessee named Luke Brown, number five mm-hmm. prospect from Tennessee, top 300 prospect nationally. And with that commitment, Shane, Arkansas, number three recruiting class in the country, number mm-hmm. one recruiting class mm-hmm. in the SEC. And – it just seems like month after month, we're getting more and more reason to buy into Sam Pittman's Arkansas Razorback program. And, you know, it's so hard to remember when Arkansas is a laughing stock. Mm-hmm. If I were to tell you, fast forward two years, they got the number one class in the SEC, you would have thought, well, by God, they must have hired Nick Saban somehow. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just, it's, a, it's remarkable. And again, I understand this is, you know, this may not be where Arkansas finishes, but it's a yeah. it's a hell of a start to this recruiting cycle for absolutely for the man. Razorbacks. You got to be careful. That's that's the thing with the NIL. Look for those hungry pro, those those hungry programs with deep pockets. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that are gonna that are gonna have these recruiting classes. Arkansas. When this NIL thing rolled out, one of the first schools I thought about was Arkansas. How could you not? You know what I'm saying? It is a rich program. So I, I just think. Hey, if you can't win it, buy it. So that's what that's what some of these boys are going to do, and and we're going to see how it plays out. And one more thing, Shane, before we get to our interview, let's kick it on down to uh, Baton Rouge real quick, because the Tigers uh, they landed themselves a transfer from Ohio State. Selvin Banks, a cornerback, LSU is is reworking that entire secondary, and why this is a big news, Shane. I mean. Banks was, uh, from what I understand, a little banged up during his Ohio State career, but 43 tackles, 13 passes defended, two interceptions, and was a preseason All-American, preseason Thorpe Award, preseason Bronco Nagurski watch list last season. Ooh, buddy. I mean, this this is a guy where, hey, if even if he adds nothing to your program, you took a sw- swing. If, if he hits – you know, you may have got yourself an all SEC type player, and I, I think this is the mm-hmm. type of addition that's going to go under the radar that uh, could be a big deal for the uh, for the Tigers this season. Absolutely, man. You know what I'm saying? What does it hurt? What does it I, hurt? I, I I think it's a great ad, and you know who knows? It it may hit. It may it may be just what you needed in that locker room. I mean, if anything, it's competitive depth. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, and you can never have too much of that in the SEC. And one more thing with LSU, Shane, interesting. You know, we thought this uh, quarterback competition, Miles Brennan, maybe he's the front runner. Then they add Arizona Mm -hmm. State transfer, Jaden Daniels. Now, oh, I guess it's a two-man race. Well, the buzz out of Baton Rouge, Shane, Garrett Nussmeyer, the redshirt freshman. We got to see a little bit of him last year. He played in just four games and redshirted. Sounds like he's making a big jump in this race. It sounds like we got us a three-man race down here in Baton Rouge. So let's kick it over to Brian Kelly real quick, who uh, just here on Monday was praising the young freshman quarterback. Since you started here and, you know, through now, what have you seen from Garrett Nussmeyer kind of developing these last few months? Yeah, so it's much more about the the, the technical things. Um, look, he there is a young man that uh, has got an incredible amount of confidence. Um, you know, he's going he's gonna to fit it in, the, you know, phone booth throws uh, as as well as anybody that I've been around uh, he's got you know the makeup um, of, of a great quarterback but there's been you know this development technically that that has been you know I think from my perspective um, nice to see you know as we've gone through the spring and uh, yeah he's he's doing a really nice job what a name. Garrett Gussmeyer. No, no, no. Yeah, Nuss, just, Nussmeyer. Nussmeyer. I'm sorry. Garrett Nussmeyer. That's right. I mean, you, you ever see those guys, like those actors, and then you're like, wait a minute, his, his name's really not Tom Hanks? <laughs> <laughs> they changed it at some point? I think Garrett should have switched this thing a little bit before he got to college. <laughs> so I just wanted to make that note, Shane. I mean, we got the uh, the spring game coming up for LSU, so don't – you know, everybody is already going to have their mm-hmm. eyes on this quarterback competition – Let's see how Garrett Nussmeyer looks with the lights come on, with them mm-hmm. LSU fans out there eager to see what the Brian Kelly era is all about. I cannot wait to, yeah. to kind of overanalyze every pass they make in the spring game. You know what? 
Which which team? Uh, let me ask you, Mike. This is a little off subject, but I am curious. So just give me the top three teams you can't wait to see. I, you know, I, I mean, there's been a lot of turnover at a lot of programs, LSU being one of them. And we got new players. We got new, new coaching staff all over the country. I'm just kind of curious, you know, week one when it kicks off, forget the opponent, mm-hmm. anything like that. You just would love to see a couple series from this team. Which what was the top three that you're looking at? Looking forward to seeing. Yeah, that's neat. I got I got my I got mine. I'm just kind of curious where you're at. Okay, I got three, and these are the three I'm mm-hmm. locked in on. I've been for weeks now, and I've been calling them the wild cards of the SEC, Shane, because I think they could go either way. They could they could boom. They could be a huge mm-hmm. surprises, or they could be in for a rough season. And I have no idea. It starts with LSU, mm-hmm. with all the turnover, with all the transfers. How's this all going to mesh together under uh, a coach who's who's coming down here to win a championship? Make no mistake. That's why he's down there in Baton Rouge. So, mm-hmm. dying to see the Tigers, dying to see the Florida Gators, Shane. What are they going to look okay. like under Billy Napier? We're all excited about the Billy Napier era, but can they get this thing going week one? Mm-hmm. Particularly with Utah, Kentucky, and Tennessee right out the gate. They better be ready. <laughs> and then the other one, Shane, is Ole Miss with – Losing all three coordinators, losing a lot mm-hmm. of talent to the NFL, but they're bringing in so much talent via the transfer portal. Lane Kiffin's a wizard down there in Oxford, so <laughs> he may say some crazy stuff. He may have his team fainting left and right, but he, now make, yeah. make no mistake, he is a hell of a coach. So I'm, I'm curious to see how far Ole Miss comes this offseason as well. I like it. I like it, Mike. I, I thought LSU was the top of my list as well. Can't wait to see what Chip Kelly brings to the SEC. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I think it's going to be exciting brand, exciting product, any to say the least. You know, uh, my my second one though is South Carolina. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've got to. I mean, the hype is it? Is it? I mean, do we officially buy in? I think week one, couple. I, it wouldn't surprise me if they go straight down the field. Score a touchdown and just Twitter it implodes, you know. <laughs> just, just it, it's over. Hang up. They're winning the natty. So South Carolina, that's that's my number two, and um, the number three is close. I I, I was going to go Kentucky um, just because of of the spring game. You, you know, just it's just I don't know this off this team looked legit. It looked ready to play. But I want to see what it looks like against a, a an opponent. You know, mm-hmm. uh, with the lights on, but. I also kind of want to see Auburn. I want to see if, if – if is this a program to be worried about or is this a program that, you know, the expectations are way too low. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. we we were wrong about this team. So, I, I'm going to – I'm leaning more toward Auburn just because I think we're going to know more about them week one uh, that either we were right or we were way off. Mm-hmm. All right, Shane, let's kick it over. We've held off long enough to our interview here with Mike Morgan of ESPN SEC Network. I think you guys are really, really going to love the insight from Mike. All right, we're pleased to be joined by Mike Morgan. He's an ESPN and SEC Network announcer. And, of course, he's been on the show before. And you're missing out if you are not checking out the J.C. and Morgan College Football Podcast. It's Mike and our buddy J.C. Sherbert. Mike, thank you so, so much for joining me once again. I really appreciate you. Uh, I'm glad to do it, Mike. Appreciate the work that you do. Appreciate the plug on the uh, on the podcast. I think we're probably uh, reaching the same audience you are, right? SEC fans, college football fans. Uh, that's kind of our our sweet spot. And, uh, you know, this time of year, it's spring football and SEC baseball for me. But, uh uh, love talking about the same things that uh, that you and your audience do, and more than happy to do it. Yeah, and of course, uh, you were on the call there for the, the Kentucky Blue and White spring game. You did a tremendous job with that. So I wanted to have you on to to talk about some Kentucky football because it, it was a little bit unique. I mean, they, they held the game. Uh, it was not even the conclusion of spring. They still had a couple practices after, and and of course there was uh, the snowstorm that came in. So, <laughs> what was it like covering a uh, a spring game in a little bit of a blizzard there? <laughs> uh, it was the most unique spring game experience I've ever had, and I've certainly called my fair share around the league. And I was trying to think back of the coldest I've ever been during a spring game, and. I don't think anything stacks up to it. For those that don't know, I mean, it was literally snowing an hour before kickoff. 
uh, strong winds and you know, temperatures in the 30s, uh, it, hardly spring weather. I was up talking to Tony Neely, longtime SID at Kentucky. He's been there 28 years. I said, have you ever seen anything like this? He said, no, Mike, this one's a first. So, you know, we've had a brutal winter overall throughout the South, but that was taking it to another level. It, it affected the overall uh, fan, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd and, and kind of the, the atmosphere. I don't really think it affected the, the play on the field because once they got the snow melted, you know, it's, it's the turf and it's, it's the playing conditions were good. Other than the fact that it was a little windy, which quarterbacks never like, uh, the, the play wasn't affected too much. And what I like what Mark Stoops did compared to what I've seen with some other spring games that I've called in the past is he, he did ones versus ones, two versus two. So we got to see, you know, the, the best uh, going up against the best. We got to see Will Levis going up against the best guys that Kentucky has to offer in the secondary and on the line. And we all know defense is very limited on a spring game, okay? It's, it's, there's no exotic blitzes, very vanilla. You can't hit the quarterback. It's not exactly intimidating to go over the middle if you're a wide receiver. So these, these things tend to always favor the offense. But I think it all starts with Will Levis. Levis is, to me, I was reading a, a, uh, a list – uh, earlier this morning, and this is from a, a Vegas list, so they're not doing it with bias. It's just based on odds, basically. And they were t- ranking the top quarterbacks in the SEC one through fourteen, and they had Will Levis number nine. I mean, and I've seen a couple of other publications that have him in that area. With all due respect, that's laughable. Uh, once you get past the Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young, who's you know certainly going to be at the top of that list for everybody. I don't know how many people I would put ahead of Will Levis. And I can tell you this much, talking with scouts, there are not a whole lot of people NFL scouts would put ahead of Will Levis. Will Levis has the potential to be a first-round draft pick. He's got the size. He's got the athleticism. He's got the intelligence. And he's got a year behind him where he led the team to 10 wins. So, uh, to me, it all starts at quarterback for all these teams. And I think Kentucky is in as good a shape as anybody not named Alabama going into this year. Well, Mike, perfect segue, because that's what I was going to ask you about. Will Levis going into year two here at Kentucky as a starting quarterback. And, you know, we we all know these spring games. They're just exhibitions. But my man's out here diving to, for points. I, I'm sure Mark Stoops didn't care to see uh, his, his starting quarterback try to dive into the end zone here. But it, I think that just goes to show his competitiveness. And you kind of already hit on it there, but – do you anticipate Will Levis, who was already a good player last season, do you anticipate him making a jump in year two uh, in this Kentucky offense? I do. Uh, now, look, they lose Wondell Robinson, and that's, that's a huge loss. And the question is going to become, you know, who, who is going to step up at wide receiver to replace those 104 receptions? But Levis himself, first he had Liam Cohen, one NFL coordinator. Now he's got Scangarello who comes from the 49ers and worked in in a a, a system that clearly is to Stoops liking. When you sit down and talk to these guys, as we did, what they, what they all love is what San Francisco and the Rams are running in the NFL. That's the offense that Mark Stoops made a decision a year ago that he wants Kentucky to look more like. We all know they can ground and pound behind the big blue wall. They've been doing that for years with great success, but at some point you do need to be able to, to, to be more, elaborate in the passing game they were that last year not eye-popping numbers that's not what they what Kentucky is all about but but they're now a threat in the in the passing game and they're now a threat vertically and quite frankly they just weren't in years past very pedestrian quarterback play very pedestrian wide receiver play they're trying to amp that up and Will Levis is the perfect guy to do that like I said he's going to be playing on Sundays next year uh he has all of that when you sit down and talk to this kid you feel like you're talking to like a 10 year NFL veteran. He's just, he's just different in a lot of ways. So I think he makes progress this year. They've got 10 wins under his direction a year ago. And I could make the argument that this year uh, they will be a little bit more settled in, even though it's a new coordinator, it's the same type of philosophy and the same type of uh, overall scheme with, a, with different wrinkles and terminology, obviously. So I think for me, you can make an argument Levis is the second best quarterback in this league. Uh, With all due respect to Jefferson and Hooker and Rodgers and Richardson, 
Uh, I think you could make a strong argument that's, that he is the second best quarterback in this league. And I think the way a lot of NFL scouts are looking at it, that's exactly where they have him now. Hmm. And, and you, you hit on the fact that we got a new offensive coordinator in Lexington, Rich Scangarello, also a new offensive line coach, Zach Yenzer. But I thought uh, Mark Stoops did a really smart thing and got two guys from the San Francisco 49ers. So they are familiar with one another. They're familiar with the system they're going to be implementing in Lexington, which is not going to be that dissimilar to what is already there. I know they got hired right before spring, so they're probably learning the players just like the players are learning them at this point in time. But what's uh, what's the early indication on, on how those two coaches are – uh, implementing back into the college system and, and how the players are, are implementing into their system. Well, you know, the answer is a Kentucky guy and, and uh, has, has ties to the state and, and knows uh, former uh, coaches there. I mean, that, that's a natural fit. Uh, that, that one, like the offensive line is, is not going to, uh, to miss a beat. And I think offensively, an uh, interesting story, just sitting down with Scangarello, uh, I asked him, I said, what, what did you know about Kentucky football and Will Levis before you got this job? And he said they were on the road in December and they're sitting at the hotel. It's a Saturday night. Uh, and he and a couple of other assistant coaches happened to turn on a Kentucky game. And Scangarello says, well, who, who is this Will Levis kid? And the coaches kind of gave him a little background, transfer from Penn State, blah, 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 blah. And Scangarello just his eyes kind of lit up like, yeah. That's an NFL quarterback. And so he's a, that's a big reason why he took the job. He wasn't just going to take the job if there wasn't somebody he could really utilize in the fashion that he wants to. So I, I don't think the, the, the coaching changes are going to get the most attention. I understand that. I, I actually think that's, the, that's not the biggest concern. To me, the biggest concern, again, is how do you replace Wondell Robinson? And you don't have a wide receiver on this roster that caught more than – 13 balls a year ago in a Kentucky uniform. Dane Key is a freshman that they are really high on. He, he made some big plays in the spring game. That's who they're hoping can be, that that big outside threat that, quite frankly, they have not had at Kentucky. Wandell was more of a slot guy, a smaller wide out. Uh, but they're hoping Key can be that kind of guy. Demarcus Harris is a transfer from Virginia Tech, another guy who played well in the spring game, and another guy who – they believe can take that wide receiving core to the next level. So it's weird. They, they lose their playmaker, but they believe they're the deepest they've been at the, at the position since Mark Stoops has been there. And then the offensive line, you lose three guys who are probably going to be NFL bound, uh, but you signed a, a five-star kid uh, in Keontae Goodwin, who uh, looks like he is going to be outstanding, might start right away as a freshman. You do have the returners and Horsey and Cox, on the line, and I think the tight end room will be busy this year. So, And we already know what they can do running. I don't need to mention Rodriguez and Smoke. They like Tom McClain out of the backfield. So I think offensively, they're not going to take a step back. They might even take a step forward. The biggest concern to me overall is going to be the secondary. Now, you lost a lot of key players from that secondary a year ago. Uh, I, 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 I wonder what the pass rush is going to be. You lost a great one in Pascal there. So defensively, what is Kentucky going to look like? Because they definitely lost some key components from a year ago. Mm -hmm. now, it's interesting. I was also going to ask you about uh, Jatuan McClain, the running back. We know what we got in Chris Rodriguez. He's, he's likely going to leave Kentucky as the all-time leading rusher. So we got a stud at the running back position. But what is – this Kentucky staff think they can get out of McLean. What will his role be this fall for, for the Kentucky offense? Well, I think just, just kind of judging by the tea leaves and, and the conversations we had with the coaching staff, you're going to see the backs used as receivers more. They haven't seen a ton of that at Kentucky. I think the number one guy in that role will be McLean. Like Rodriguez is lower the shoulder pads between the tackles, tough runner. We know that. Smoke's got some work to do. I mean, the way the coaching staff framed it, he was kind of fifth string going into that game. Uh, he's, he's got some things to make sure he's in the, to do to make sure he's in the good graces of the staff for him to get more, more touches. But I think McLean has a chance to be the top, maybe third down receiver could lead the, the running back uh, core 
in receptions overall. But when you talk about McLean and the coaching staff, they seem to be very high on him. Hmm. Switching over to the defensive side of the ball, you, you already hit on, you know, we got some questions in the secondary, but what should be the strength of this Kentucky defense is this linebacking crew. I mean, we've got some real solid SEC players, J.J. Weaver, Jaquez Jones, DeAndre Square, the youngster Trevin White, and, and don't forget Jordan Wright. What does this Kentucky staff think about this uh, outstanding linebacking core they got? Well, you hit on it. That That's their strength. It, it's the linebacking core. It's not even close. I mean, you, you know what you're getting there. Uh, you, you know and you feel really good. I think J.J. Weaver is going to have a career year. And when you, when you stand next to him, he's got that NFL frame. He's 6'5". He's long. He's got to put his weight back on. He lost about 20 pounds, uh, but he's having about 5,000 calories a day, which I think we all wish we could do as part of the – you know, putting on some weight because the coaching staff tells you you need to. What a luxury that is! Uh, but but he, along with the Andre Square, I mean that that is your your bell cow defensively to get it going. Uh, that that is going to be the strength of the defense bar none. I mentioned the concerns in the secondary. You know, Carrington Valentine is certainly a guy that could could lead the way there. But they're going to have to replace a lot in that second. There is no question about that. Yusuf Corker is a, is a big loss overall. Uh, they just don't have a ton of guys returning. That would be a little bit of a concern for me. And, and I don't know if you replace Josh Pascal either. I mean, that guy is, is one of the top playmakers. He made so many big plays for Kentucky last year. They don't win 10 games without him. Uh, Oxendine did not play in this game, but he is going to be a key guy on the interior of that line when he is healthy. Uh, you, you talk about Rogers, talk about Ripka, but I think Oxendine could be the guy that, that leads the way uh, on the line. I think it all starts. So again, with that linebacking core, you mentioned, I'd be surprised if that's not one of the better linebacking cores in this league. Now, after taking in the spring game there, Mike, and talking to the coaches, what's your expectation level for Kentucky this fall? Cause I'm, I know everybody's going to be picking Georgia as they probably should with all the the defending national champions, all the talent they got in Athens. But Georgia comes to Kentucky this fall in November. Let's hope for Kentucky's sake it's another blizzard that probably play in, in their favor. But, um, you, know, you know, I'm not asking you to sit here and pick Kentucky to win the East, but do you think <laughs> – I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> if things break right, you know, it's a, another miracle-type season for Kentucky – could they potentially end the season in Atlanta representing the SEC East? Well, look, I don't expect Georgia to be as dominating as they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. That being said, they're the team to beat, and I don't think it's even close. Uh, I, I, I've been covering this league a while, and I was trying to think the last time a team like, like Georgia, the last time a team in the East had this much separation from the rest of the pack. You know, I grew up when it was Spurrier versus Phil Fulmer, and every year it was Florida, Tennessee, and those two teams would battle it out for the Eastern Division crowd. And then, you know, more recently, uh, then, then Florida had their run under Urban Meyer, and then Georgia started to climb with Mark Richt, and then South Carolina had a, had a, a window there in time under Steve Spurrier where they were a legitimate threat. But right now, I mean, it's Georgia, and then there is a gap. So if we're being honest about it, I think Kentucky is under great direction with Mark Stoops, who's done a phenomenal job, another 10-win season. I mean, two 10-win seasons in a four- or five-year span in Lexington, that's ridiculous. Uh, he has done a, a sensational job, and that's why he's been courted by so many other schools. And I think Tennessee will be improved. I think I love the hire of Billy Napier at Florida. I think Shane Beamer is doing good things in, in Columbia but nobody is in the is in the area code of Georgia right now overall. I just don't see it. I think the West is a little bit more diversified in, in teams that could actually beat Alabama and contend for the West. I think it's Georgia one, and then I think Kentucky is trying to do something that they've never done, finish second place two years in a row. You know, they last year they go five and three in the league. That's huge. You know, they 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 knock off some really good teams in a 10 win season. They win a bowl game. I think one of the things I love about Kentucky football fans is they're realistic. You know, they don't run to message boards when they don't win the uh, SEC championship every year in football and say, gosh, darn it. We, we, 
we're underachieving, fire Mark Stoops, fire this guy, fire that guy. That's not the way they look at it. They appreciate the fact that they are competitive now. And for a while there, that simply wasn't the case. So Georgia won, and then I think there's a big battle for two. I think it's Kentucky. I think it's Tennessee. I think the odds makers might actually pick Tennessee uh, to, to finish second in that league. They seem to be really high and what Josh Heupel is going to be able to do in year two. I'm not quite there yet. Like, I, I want to see it more than one year before I'm convinced Tennessee is on that big of a rise. Uh, so it's, for me, Kentucky won 10 games last year with a minus 11 turnover margin. I've never seen anything like that. That's going to improve. Uh, I, I love Levis. He's only going to improve. But I still think there are some concerns there, and I think the rest of the East is getting better. So I, I, I think, you know, somewhere, anywhere between second and even fourth, you're going to have a good season, but you might not finish as high as you want. And again, I don't, I don't think anybody catches Georgia this year. All right, last thing for you, Mike. I know you're a proud Heisman Trophy voter. So I just wanted to ask you, is there a, one particular vote that was just so incredibly tough for you to, to cast that ballot for number one? Is there, is there any, uh, you know, vote for the Heisman Trophy that stands out in your mind like that? It's so funny, Mike. This year was going to be that. If if the 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 surprises didn't happen late with Alabama, and at that point, it went from one of the most difficult votes that I was ever going to have. And I know I don't just speak for me because I I know a lot of other Heisman Trophy voters who were were struggling with this. If if that just went a different direction. And all of a sudden, Bryce Young is not your, I don't want to say easy selection, but I think he clearly pulled ahead. I really had no idea who I was going to vote for. I really don't know. I mean, for a while there, there was momentum for Jordan Davis, an interior defensive lineman, uh, uh, to, to, to win the award. You had Hutchinson at Michigan, who I think was number two on my ballot, if, if my memory serves, um, who certainly deserved a lot of praise. So you had two defensive players who were getting high praise. And then you had a running back, uh, you know, and then you had your usual array of quarterbacks, but you didn't have that quarterback that really stood out. It was really bizarre. So it was going to be last year. And then the, the Alabama decided to make it easy on all of us with their performance in Atlanta in the SEC championship game. And then it's like, okay, it's Bryce Young. It's, it's, it's not even that close for, for many of us. So that that's probably the most difficult. The other one would be I voted for Deshaun Watson the year. I believe Derek Henry won it. Uh, I, I think, um, and that's one of those, if everybody could have voted after the national championship game, I think people would have sided with me and voted for Deshaun. But as we know, the vote has to come in before the playoff. And so they voted Derrick Henry. And look, there's no shame in voting Derrick Henry. He was a beast in college. He's a beast in the NFL. Uh, and maybe the only one that I'm, I feel like I'm in the minority on, but I think time uh, stood pretty well on this. I picked Christian McCaffrey the one year that he did everything at Stanford. The problem was nobody saw it because it's Pac-12. It's late at night. Uh, they had a network in shambles. And so if they weren't on national TV, People didn't know Christian McCaffrey. They didn't care Christian McCaffrey, but McCaffrey had one of the most productive seasons in the history of the sport. So uh, those are the ones that stand out to me that were maybe the most uh, difficult to vote on. Yeah. And you may have another difficult vote upcoming. I, I know you, you know, it's so far away. You're not going to be casting your ballot in the preseason, but Will Anderson, I mean, he just looks like just a, a game wrecker. For Alabama, I don't know if you saw the spring game there last week. They had to take him out of the ball game because he was messing up huh. the game plan so much. But uh, it, it certainly sounds like the voters are, are, you know, for years and years, you wouldn't even consider a defensive player, not you specifically, but it just, just seems like the voters, now they're kind of opening that back up. So, you know, do you think it's realistic that uh, Alabama's pass rushing demon there, Will Anderson, you know, could be a Heisman Trophy winner by season's end? Oh, sure. I, I, I think he's definitely on everybody's radar. Uh, I would just say this. If you're looking at it realistically, what has to happen for a defensive player to win it, I think, is there has to be a lack of a dominating season by a quarterback 
on a playoff contending team. And we had that last, like nobody was going to vote for Stetson Bennett. So if, if Bryce didn't have the game that he did and Stetson Bennett is, is that guy, well, he wasn't going to win the Heisman. So that opened it up for all these defensive players, but that's a rare year. More often than not, you show me the top five teams in the country and I'll show you a quarterback that's having a dominating season and he's likely going to get a lot of Heisman votes. So I, I think two things have to happen. Anderson has to go off, which we know he's more than capable of, but I think it has to be a lackluster year of quarterbacks uh, on great teams. They have to have very pedestrian numbers and, and not just eye popping seasons in order to make voters say, you know what, I got to look at another position. That's just how I see it. Well, Mike, I really appreciate all the time you've given me. I'll let you get out of here. I cannot, uh, you know, recommend you enough to, I know we got a lot of SEC baseball listeners out there. Mike does a great job calling the baseball games, but what I got my eye on, everybody knows, is that college football season. And when that rolls around, Mike will be, on the call for ESPN and the SEC Network calling the best conference in college football. So, Mike, I, th- I cannot thank you enough. Oh, and don't forget to, to follow Mike at Morgan on Air on Twitter. Thank you so much for dropping so much knowledge on us. Mike, I always appreciate the time. Appreciate the job you do. All right, Chase, I just want to say thanks again to Mike Morgan for joining the show. Really knocked it out of the park there. You can give him a follow. Morgan on Air on the Twitter machine. But, mm-hmm. um You got anything else, brother, before we call this an episode? No, man. Uh, Only two beers on this show, (laughs) so that was a little better. (laughs) But it was – no, it's just – you know, it's fun. It's spring games here. Um, You know, again, you're just – you're worried about the injuries and stuff. Just as long as everybody stays healthy, you know, no coaches get fired, you know, we're going to be all right. We're going to – we're going to ease back into this thing, but it's just great to have actual football content again, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next show. No doubt. Well, brother, I appreciate you hopping on the line. I appreciate mm-hmm. each and every one of you for hanging out, as always, and staying true with us through – it's freaking April here, Shade, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make buzz. We're trying to put out content, and we're doing the best we can. So let us know mm-hmm. if there's ways to improve the show. Happy to uh, – to make those adjustments because we want to bring you guys the best show possible heading into the upcoming college football season. But that's going to do it. I'll catch you on the next one. All right. See you guys. Go Vols.